sciences, because um, even though a great deal of specialized research in the social and natural sciences is not humanistic, it does not directly uh, engage these questions about the, 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 the ultimate meaning of life, I think these, these classic works in those fields, in those fields often do. Um, now similarly on, on the pedagogical side, I think Cronman's secular humanism, again, however appropriate it is for himself as a personal credo, is too narrow and sectarian a conception of humanism to serve as a basis for rescuing the liberal arts. Cronman rightly rejects religious fundamentalism as a basis for teaching great books because religious fundamentalists are not open to the possibilities that human life has no transcendent meaning. Fundamentalists, in this sense, are dogmatic. They cannot entertain the exploration of views found in the classic literature that often suggest that there may be no God or that even if there is a God, he doesn't care about us. I mean, these are views co common in the classics of our tradition, and it's hard to explore them, entertain them um, uh, openly uh, on, a, on, a, on the basis of a fundamentalist uh, religious belief. Um, now, there are no doubt Jewish, Christian, and Islamic fundamentalists who all share Tertullian's famous skeptical question, what in the world has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Uh, Tertullian uh, might represent a kind of fundamental, Christian fundamentalism in this way that, uh, right, that Greek philosophy and science has no bearing or meaning or relevance to the truth we find in the Bible, so why be concerned with it? Um, and again, uh, not only Christians, but Jews and Muslims have shared Tertullian skepticism about the importance of these other traditions. But there also have always been Jewish, Christian, and Islamic humanists who have passionately loved Greek philosophy, literature, and science. At, la at least since Philo and since St. Paul, who studied Greek philosophy. Uh, the Roman writer Lacantius was known as the Christian Cicero. So there's always been another tradition within the Abrahamic faiths of a deep passion and commitment to uh, Greek learning, classical um, science and philosophy. Yet Cronman seems in some places, although not in conversation, but in some places in the book, seems to deny the existence or even possibility of a genuinely religious humanism. Uh, he says in page 199, quote, there is a more basic sense in which every religion is fundamentalist. Um, and he, he, in his discussion of secular humanism, he contrasts secular humanism consistently with religious fundamentalism without, again, exploring the possibility of a kind of religious humanism that would be in between uh, fundamentalism on the one hand and secular humanism on the other. Now, I think this, this doesn't do justice to the lived reality of the tradition of these faiths in which uh, there's been bitter, uh, millennia-long controversy and even deadly conflict between fundamentalists in those faiths and humanists in those faiths. And I think we have to recognize the, these, the complexity and the, the, the multifaceted nature of these traditions. Um, now, a question which Cronman doesn't um, consider is whether a secular humanist or secular, secularism isn't also a kind of dogmatic position. Perhaps a secularist dogmatically rejects even the possibility of a transcendent or divine dimension to life. I mean, I looked up the word secular in a, you know, many dictionaries, and online it's easy to find many different definitions, and all the definitions I can find of secular um, employ it has a, um, <coughs> a word of um, of sharp disjunction and, and, and mutual, ex mutual ex exclusivity. That is, to be secular is to not be religious. Um, to be a, even, even if used in a religious context, to be a secular priest is not to be a religious priest, right? And, um, and so secular meaning this worldly and not next worldly or not otherworldly, uh, if, if secular uh, is so disjunctive and so exclusive, it seems in a way to, to be just as dogmatic as the fun a fundamentalist position in a way, or, or even a religious humanist position. That is, it's taken a, it seems like secularism is, is standing on a, a firm commitment, uh, denying the reality of the possibility of, of, uh, of another dimension in human life, only this world. Um, now, in some ways, Cronman's use of the term secular and secular humanist clashes with his own deeper account of human nature. Again, in the book, he rightly insists that it's part of the essence of our own human nature, right, that we long for a kind of transcendence, 
from the evils and limitations of this world. Um, human beings, in this sense, are essentially, are essentially religious and not secular animals, right? We live in a secular world, but we hope to escape its limitations in many ways, right? So Plato already noticed this, right? That every time a lover swears undying love to uh, his, or her, his or her lover, there's a kind of longing to escape the transience of, uh, of our secular mortal world in hopes to, um, uh, hope to achieve a kind of timelessness a stopping time, the lovers want to stop time so they can enjoy in perpetuity the moment. Um, we often, we resent, right, the facts of our own death, the reality and the imminence of our own death, and again, in, a, in an attempt to escape from this world. Um, so in, so in, in terms of these deep human longings, uh, Croman's account of human nature isn't secular. I mean, it, it recognizes a kind of yearning for the transcendent. But in other ways, Cronman's humanism is secular, that is, that uh, he seems to, to say that although we do have these longings for a transcendent realm, um, those longings are ultimately tragic, that is, they're, they're going to be unfulfilled. Um, he says, uh, quote, we're, we are dying animals, fastened to bodies and fated to pass away, who yet yearn for something more. So here, Cronman, recognizes the yearning for the transcendent, but also is fairly certain that, uh, that that's a tragic. It's a, it's, a, it's a longing that's not going to be answered uh, by any ultimate reality. Um, so I think to, to, to develop a, a more common ground uh, with other religious humanists, I think maybe our principle should be focused just on plain humanism rather than religious humanism or secular humanism. Uh, let's find common ground in a kind of humanism that tries to stay open to the, uh, <coughs> the question of the ultimate possibilities of the transcendent dimension to life. And in that common ground, both secular humanists and religious humanists can uh, cooperate in the uh, renewal of the liberal arts. Now, one of the fascinating things about uh, Croman's book is the way in which he articulates, uh, you might say, what it feels like to be a student in uh, the different epochs of uh, American education that he describes. Um, Cromen, again, I get, think gets this from Max Weber, this kind of uh, ability to empathetically recreate the experience of uh, people in, in the past, and not only in the past. Um, uh, I, I don't know any other uh, advocate for reform in, in higher education, uh, I think, who has such a gift for describing what it feels like to be a student in today's colleges and universities. Uh, for example, I want to read a, a paragraph from his book where he describes uh, how many students respond to the tremendous freedom we give them in, in our colleges when we ask them to choose 36 courses out of the uh, course catalog, in, in Dartmouth's case, of more than 1,600 courses. Croman says, quote, nor is the freedom students enjoy to design their own course of studies always a source of personal gratification. As often, it produces anxiety and regret a disturbingly large number of today's undergraduates, even at our best colleges and universities, spend four years sampling courses with literal, little or no connection, moved by fancy or curiosity, but guided by no common organizing principle or theme. Their freedom leaves them with a transcript that's a patchwork of disconnected bits and scraps, except for whatever modest structure the choice of a major supplies. Too many graduates today view their college years, the most leisurely years of their lives, until they wash up on the far shores of retirement, as a wasted opportunity squandered in the pursuit of a disorganized and idiosyncratic program of study. They view it with regret as a lost chance to explore the question of what living is for before the demands of life take hold and they become too busy to ask it. I think this is fascinating and very insightful comment based on my own experience talking to students and my own experience sitting on the uh, Dartmouth uh, Committee on Instruction. You know, we have a faculty committee that oversees curriculum. And on that committee, we looked at surveys and other data about students' experience and attitudes. Um, we saw, for instance, surveys of graduating seniors uh, asked about their experience in college and uh, what they uh, liked or didn't like about it. And we saw a very disturbing high, you know, uh, great majorities of students reflecting high dissatisfaction 